I think the Russians are in a dilemma because uh, they have to ask themselves, why would the United States want to, or the Europeans want to finish the war? I mean, we're not even fighting with our own men. So, um, so the, a good war for NATO would be a war of frozen front lines where the Ukrainians and Russians just kill each other over years. My point is the dilemma for Russia is how do you incentivize the West to sit down and talk? Well, you begin to take more and more territory. But the more territory you take, the more complicated any diplomatic process is going to be. Uh, I mean, look at now, the West are, we're starting finally uh, politicians and media beginning to speak about the possibility of finding a peace with Russia. Well, what are we suggesting? Okay, you can keep Crimea. Uh, and we'll, you know, uh, and, and we'll send in like European peacekeepers. You know, the, the people have been fighting you, by the way, so sending the weapons to b patrol the borders. And Ukraine is not going to be allowed to join NATO for another ten years or something. This is just beyond absurd. But the question is one of where the system will take us and here i must shout out to uh, to to ralph mumbeck who's a great thinker on uh, on youtube actually who who pointed out that um wherever you go over world history there's there's a couple of times when you will see certain strategies emerge time and again and those must not necessarily emerge because of um of somebody having the strategy but just that as an outcome of 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 what's happening and the the example here is that this divide and conquer strategy that we've seen that the us has been using um is 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 coming up time and again in order to make sure that the that the periphery remains weak while the center um remains remains united and then gets to dominate the rest right and that is a necessary component of a hegemonic system so if we have a functioning hegemonic system we will see that this kind of policies have been or are are kind of how the world works now the question is if the BRICS system is able to overcome this so BRICS is not fighting against another block BRICS is fighting against this um against this divide and conquer um principle to break up the the potential cooperative uh force that all of these countries have how good do you think are the chances for BRICS to overcome this principle on on which on which hegemony rests um uh, well there's a lot of economic incentives and political and also military by having stability but uh, but the problem is uh, if you can instigate enough tensions and conflicts uh as we see with NATO, uh, countries begin to see a military alliance as being a good source of security. So, um, uh, and I mean, this is also why military alliances tend to suffer when peace breaks out, because the whole purpose behind that uh, very unhelpful uh, structure uh, goes away. So, no, but the, the great irony for the United States, though, is, as well as the British before them, is uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of these policies in terms of divide and conquer was to prevent uh, an alternative hegemon from emerging. Uh, this is why the British and Americans pursued what can be referred to as an offshore uh, balancing position or strategy. So the, this is why you see the British and Americans that tend to join in on the wars somewhat late when you have world wars, for example. And uh, after all the main actors have bled themselves dry and been weakened, the main goal is that the offshore balancer enters the war late and just imposes uh, a settlement which restores a balance of power to make sure once not one side is too powerful compared to the rest. And this way, this way uh, a hegemon can't emerge in Eurasia, which can come and threaten the British and the Americans later. Uh, this is why when you had people like, um, I forgot his name, the, oh, the American president after World War II. Um, Truman? Yes, Truman. Yeah, that's why I said, you know, beginning of the war. Uh, he said, you know, if the um, if the uh, if the Nazis are winning, we should help the Soviets. If the Soviets are winning, we should help the Nazis. And this way, you know, they kill each other as many as possible. And at the end, we, you know, they try to restore another balance where no one can dominate. Well, in a multipolar Eurasia, it's not like the 19th or 20th century. The alternative to a British or an American hegemon isn't a Russian one. Indeed, uh, you should allow the... Uh, I think there's a natural balancing in Eurasia that is uh, 
the main concern now obviously is China. But if China becomes uh, well too powerful and begins to throw its weight around and and dictate to other countries, what do you think the the, the Indians can do? They're going to try to become less dependent on. Uh, the Chinese supply chains and look more towards uh, Iran, Russia. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is common sense. But uh, I think the U.S. in its efforts to restore dominance is doing the exact opposite. You know, the the Europeans are cutting the relations with Russia. So okay, now Russia becomes a bit more dependent on China than it otherwise otherwise would have been. We're telling the Indians to reduce their ties with Iran. Well. Now Iran will become a little bit more dependent on China than they otherwise would have been. So we're disrupting the this natural move towards an equilibrium, and um, uh, so no, it's I think a lot of this goes against uh, national interests. Uh, but uh, but again, when it's the, the underlying assumption is that uh, NATO and the U.S. have to dominate in order to have peace, that hegemonic peace is the only peace we can imagine. Um, we, we tend to brush all of these considerations under the rug. And indeed, of course, it's foolish to go after both Russia and China at the same time. But as the Americans uh, made the point, the, pur the purpose of the war in Ukraine is to knock out Russia, uh, weaken it severely so they can focus on China. So it is, it's, uh, it's not to have a balance. It's to restore uh, U.S. dominance and primacy. But now uh, let's talk a little bit about the the reality we live in now because the strategy has failed russia is not weakened russia is in fact strengthened the ties with china are stronger than ever uh, the europeans are severely weakened um almost every large economy in in europe including the uk of course is struggling heavily is going through very difficult uh, a very difficult period now the germans first and foremost and also politically they're extremely weak the individual leaders are quite weak all of them including macron in france including uh, uh, uh scholz in germany and and um uh, the, the the uk too like they're internally fractured and uh, on top of the economic problems so this this kind of second secondary that the satellites that have been doing a lot of the jobs for jobs for the US for in the last 30 years are now all doing quite poorly uh, while the United States is, itself is going through uh, apparently what looks like a, a soul searching and just going from one extreme to another with the visions of people that 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 are that are in the um, in the driver's seat over there, although I must say the, the most recent picks for the cabinet of, of Mr. Trump are um, actually rather indicative for Mr. Mersheimer's prediction to be right that the blob in the end always finds a way to um, to steer U.S. foreign policy. So maybe the change is not that big. But overall, the turmoil is now rather in the West, not so much in the in, in Eurasia, which actually try uh, seems to be coming together and also internally strengthening. So where do you think that this dynamic is leading the is leading world politics? Well, I think there's crisis coming now simply uh, for, yeah, <laughs> to oversimplify maybe, uh, for the simple reason that uh, in the West, we're not pursuing rational policies. Now, rationality in the realist sense is uh, not res not acting in, in accordance with the international, the systemic incentives created by the international distribution of power. So, um, so for example, right after the Cold War, you can see why some of the policies we pursued were rational. That is, uh, there was a huge concentration of power with, within the United States. So well, what is what is the interest and in the U.S. express the interest to establish a world order based on dominance? What is the interest of Europe in this situation? You would like to have, instead of a U.S. dominance, you would like to have the, the assist, international system based on the collective dominance, uh, on the dominance of the collective West. So the West consisting of two pillars, the U.S. and the EU having some equality between them. So, of course, the, the, the price they paid for this was so you keep uh, Europe divided, uh, you revive the dividing lines, you have these tensions with Russia. But uh, but again, the 90s, at least, it looked like the Russians were going to get it weaker and weaker, become irrelevant. So, so you know, this is what we gambled on. But now uh, that gamble did not turn out how we thought. Now we actually see a multipolar distribution of power. Now, what is the rational act? What does the rational actor do in this situation? Well, 
you see this around the world, what the all rational states are doing. They're seeking uh, opportunity from diversifying their connections. They're uh, avoiding excessive dependence on the United States by also trading with all others. Uh, I think the, the, the Europeans, we're still locked in um, into the mindset that, uh, no, no, the only way we can have peace is by, uh, by committing ourselves only to the United States. Which is, uh, all, of course, is fueled by ideology. This assumption of this uh, liberal democratic peace, which would uh, allow us to overcome history. But um, I think it was yesterday, or von der Leyen, or one of the EU leaders were suggesting, you know, we should increase our LNG purchases from the United States, so they will have uh, perceive more value uh, of our partnership with Europe to see that we're a good ally. So now we're going to buy more expensive energy from the Americans, we're going to see our own economies become less competitive, our industries will be less competitive, uh, more of them will go to the United States as they're luring with subsidies, and we can become weaker and weaker. And uh, well, what was the interest in Europe now? It, it, it's, it, again, it goes against common sense. Uh, but we're doing the same in this country, in, in well, not just country, in Scandinavia in general. Uh, we see America has less resources, going to go to Asia. So what do we do? Do we start to diversify, adjust to the, again, as a rational state would do, you adjust to the new international distribution of power by uh, connecting with other great powers. You don't bet everything on the United States, which is becoming weaker and going to the other side of the planet. No, we are opening military bases of the Americans across the country and across the whole Scandinavia in the hope that, you know, they will understand that we're good allies, we're loyal, we're obedient, you know, they will they will stay here and take care of us. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's complete subordination and we fail to uh, pursue our national interest, we become weaker and disconnected from the rest of the world. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really absurd, but... Uh, um, but this is why I'm saying Europe is very irrational now. We're not, of course, it's going to be upheaval. Governments who don't uh, deliver on national interest, well, what is going to happen? Of course, they're going to be swept away. For a while, we're pushing back. You know, Macron holding on <laughs> after the election didn't go as he wanted. In, in Germany, we see things are predictably falling apart. You're going to see this across Europe. Um, these but leaders which have based a policy on subordinating themselves completely to the United States and become less and less relevant in the world, less secure, less prosperous, well, of course they're not going to stay in power. Uh, all they have is uh, ideological slogans that we are fighting, uh, you know, good versus evil. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's becoming obscene. But at, at some point, really the only chance to escape this this dynamic, which is to a large part an elite driven dynamic, because lots of these elites don't only they depend on the on the relationship with the United States and the best the best chance they see to rise even further is through these international supranational institutions, including the EU and NATO, of course, because today, I mean, both of these institutions are a way for politicians from small like tertiary countries like Estonia or um or, or or Bulgaria to then actually um ascend to the highest to the highest offices right and the last the, uh, the secretary general of nato was a, a norwegian guy and even as a, as a prime minister of norway he couldn't have gotten that much world stage attention as as he did as he, um it within nato um on the other hand the only remedy to that to me seems really like a change of hearts in these in the general population. And we see how these opposition forces, the real opposition forces are growing in Germany with the AFD and BSW parties, in um, in France also with the Front National and to some extent also the left the left wing with Mélenchon that didn't really want to want to go along. And we see it already in Italy. We thought it, Meloni was one of those, but then he she flipped, but she's not completely converted, apparently. And so there is also Europe is in an in-between state. And the more this this pressure keeps coming, the more the counter pressure from below will go will will bubble up. Um, but we see how the West is trying to frame that as a as a dangerous authoritarian movements from the ground but the, the, the oxygen up there is going to get less and less isn't it yeah i think so but it's also it's it's their own fault they they, they left a vacuum uh they did not deliver on basic national interests so that leaves a vacuum so then it fills up with a new uh, political alternatives which hasn't necessarily been tested 
So, uh, so you know, if you have an AfD in Germany, I'm not sure how they're going to rule. But uh, of course, at least they are speaking common sense. Let's uh, negotiate with you know the world's largest nuclear power instead of trying to defeat them. Uh, let's let's uh, yeah. But it has some uh, comparisons with media because if you look at the media in across Europe, no one could understand why any Americans would vote for Trump because. Uh, you, you can't open a single European newspaper where they explain the position of Trump. Where everything has to be condemnation. Even if they, journalists would understand his position and why people would vote for him, they could not put it into words. Because once you articulate it, then you can be accused of uh, you know, legitimizing or supporting or normalizing, well, whatever it would be. So we are stuck to the narrative. You know, He's a very bad man when this prevents us from pushing uh, well, uh, reporting basic facts. And of course, it's the same in Ukraine. Where we have to pretend as if NATO expansion isn't the source of this war, you know, we have to pretend with Nord Stream, the the Minsk Agreement, the Istanbul, uh, you know, Ukraine is winning, winning, all all this nonsense, uh, which is just fake. And so once you don't report on the news or the reality, much like the politicians aren't uh, delivering on national interest, a vacuum will emerge, and that's when this alternative media comes in because they're saying basic facts which the media aren't allowed to say. I mean. Isn't it strange that that it is not that it's not possible to explain why Americans voted for the president? They did. He got he got even won the popular vote. But uh, this is a good indication that you have been propagandized. If you're not able to explain the position of the other side, and you're not, uh, you know, and if you and if even if you're able to, you would fear the social consequences of explaining merely the position of the other side. Then you have a deep deep problem in society, and we do the same again with the Russians now. In terms of the EU, I very much agree. I think this is a problem we also saw at the end of the 19th century after a period of globalization. You saw uh, political elites seeming to have more uh, loyalty than to more international capital and, uh, and uh, yeah, as opposed to the nation state. Now, of course, we have all these international organizations and, uh, and uh, look at Rutte now. Uh, the, the Dutch prime minister at the, at the end of the... Uh, his, um, uh, his role as a uh, prime minister, he made sure to be extra hawkish on Russia, to bomb uh, Yemen, to uh, apologize for everything Israel did. Why? Well, the Dutch newspapers were clear why he wanted to get this was uh, the job interview effectively to get uh, the position in NATO. So you subordinate national interest in order to have this aspiration to have a role in these international organizations. And I think this is also to a large extent why the EU, which was meant, again, to balance the United States, to have a West consi consisting of two pillars, uh, has completely been captured by Washington. Uh, von der Leyen, I mean, it's it's absurd. If you see that the Germans go to China, you know, Schultz will, hey, let's find a way of cooperating, avoiding economic uh, warfare and tariffs. And then comes uh, their German counterparts from the EU, like the von der Leyen's and the rest. They're like, oh, no, no, we're going to sanction you. We're going to have tariffs. Uh, we're gonna, you know, de-risk, decouple. Uh, we're gonna friend shore. You know, all, all these words. Uh, so it is. Uh, it, it's it's crazy. And uh, uh, yeah, nothing is rational. Just um, yeah. The last point, I guess, uh, on on the war as well. How does any of this make any sense? If you're you know, you're in Europe, uh, you have huge war on your continent. The continent's becoming uh, yeah, consumed by war. Uh, your economy is going down the toilet. Uh, obviously. Uh, militarized dividing lines in Europe is going to make Europeans much more dependent on the US, the uh, Russians too dependent on China. This is not in the continent's interest. Uh, so why why is it that now the Americans are talking about ending the war and the Europeans are in panic that no, we cannot allow this? Well, we know if uh, the war ends on very unfavorable terms to us, uh, and the Americans will seek to make a peace with the Russians and NATO is going to have discredited itself a little bit. Um, and the United States would then uh, probably go focus on Asia instead. So it's not in our interest, really. We we can't accept an unfavorable outcome. So now you have this position where we're pushing for a war, which is uh, crushing our economies and uh, perhaps taking us to the brink of nuclear war. And uh, and uh, if you speak against the war, you're demonized. So it's uh, nothing is rational anymore. This is my main point. No, the, it's it's not it's not rational. It's actually and it's it's a, it's a flipped and it's an inversed world, which is which makes it really difficult for us. That if you say like no, we should have a peace in Ukraine that is that is that is feasible, something that just can get the guns to to be silent, 
then you're accused of actually rewarding the aggressor and that you are like you want to to be uh, good to the to warfaring parties right and the actual way is to just do more of the same thing that already killed so many people and double and triple and quadruple down in the expectation that now suddenly it's going to work because of because somebody said so and you know i'm i'm very much reminded right now with the of the the european discussion of like oh let's keep supporting ukraine let's provide let's prevent the collapse because we can it's not difficult these are the durchhalteparolen in germany on the second world war the kind of um let's let's get let's we'll continue fighting we will prevail you know the 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 the, the illusion of hitler that all you need to do is to win one or two strategic battles and then you can like push back the soviets and push back the americans and this but and and you never give up and you never stop the propagandizing right and also the self propagandizing and that's where this this disconnect with reality is then in the end what's going to bring you down horribly so to be the question is whether the europeans can stop that sir that cycle of self delusion before something even worse happens because we have uh the cdu um uh, a contender for the next chancellorship mr mertz who says like yeah we just we just used the uh, our Taurus um, missiles to threaten Russia and just fire them into Russia, and that will that will break will break them, right? That that kind of stupidity that he says, which I mean, okay, he he wants the job, but I'm not sure whether he would do it. But that's the kind of rhetoric that's okay in Germany now. Yeah, it's this. Uh, I think this is also a danger. This uh, assumption in their own on on, on that this is the moral high ground that uh, you know if you. If you oppose the war, then you're effectively just giving in to Putin. But all of this is premised on the idea, of course, that this was uh, uh, unprovoked. But it's um, it's, uh, and I think this is why it's also painful to accept defeat. Because uh, keep in mind, um, I, I know I at least uh, was warning. You know, let's not topple the Ukrainian government. I was warning this in two thousand, late two thousand thirteen. This is going to end in disaster. Uh, you know, it's going to be war. No, no, this is anti-Ukrainian. We're going to help them towards freedom, even though the Ukrainians didn't want, uh, didn't support this. Uh, and also the Minsk agreement. I remember for years I was saying, we, you know, should implement the Minsk agreement. No, no, no. Well, you know, um, it's unfair. Realities have changed now. Uh, Ukrainians should, um, you know, it's not up to Russia to dictate, you know, all this, all this idea is why, why we should ignore it. But again, none of this is, and, and all this came with this assumption of moral virtue, but you know, if if the consequence is that Ukraine will be destroyed, why why is it moral? And I think that's what brings us to the war now, because uh, in the beginning beginning of twenty twenty two, when uh, not just the United States and Britain sabotaged the peace agreement, but well, what did the West say all, all across Europe? Well, you know, we don't need the diplomacy with the Russians, so we're going to have the diplomacy later. But first, we have to strengthen the hand of the Ukrainians at the negotiation table. And, uh, you know, it's been three years now almost, and uh, there's no negotiation table. And if we now have to make a peace, uh, no matter what the peace is, it's going to be so much worse than Istanbul. Istanbul, the Russians were willing to pull back completely to where they had been uh, before they moved in with the military. Uh, all they wanted was, as we learned from everyone, has, was they wanted to for Ukraine to restore their neutrality, not to have NATO there. We said, this is immoral. We can't accept these terms. And instead... We go for you know standing up against Russia. Now you have hundreds of thousands of dead young men. You have a huge amount of territory lost. The Russian annexed uh, Russians annexed the four oblasts in Ukraine. They're not going to come in back. Uh, you have a nation exhausted, destroyed. What has happened there is just beyond terrible. And so now they're going to have to look, go back to the voters in Europe and say, oh yeah, well you know at least we put up a good fight. So this is. Um, this is something I also see now. The Ukrainians should be proud of themselves. They they fought well, but now we have to make a peace. Perhaps this is going to be a terrible narrative. <laughs> this is uh, they. Uh, that's why they, they. That's why they refuse adopting it. Right. This is again. It's not just defeat of Ukraine and U.S. It's a defeat of of Europe. It's a defeat of the narrative, and that's the one thing they can do. I mean, you only accept defeat of the narrative when you are um, when you are completely beaten, right? When you look like Germany in 1945 with a bombed out 
a Führer bunker or like you have a Hiroshima and a Nagasaki on your on your territory. That's the moment when you can convince your propagandists and your militarists that they have to give up. I mean, in Japan, it was difficult. It was really, really, really hard, even for the, the emperor to convince the military to stop the fighting. Um, it, it, like giving up is extremely difficult because it's not just giving up the, the military fight, it's giving up the entire rhetoric and then you're forced to change it. And that's that, But that's not the kind of defeat that Russia can actually impose, can it? Which is why I'm so worried. It is easy to keep the, the division in Europe boiling. And that's where I think your question to come back to Valdai was so important to ask also whether or not um, Russia still sees a way forward. But the Russians, they do. Uh, at least Vladimir Putin does see the at least a possibility for a Eurasian future with Europe. Yeah, definitely. But uh, let, for, let me just first say that if the Japanese hadn't uh, surrendered, the problem is then they would have been destroyed yeah. beyond the ability to recover. And look at them today. They recovered well. Uh, uh, they were, of course, better t 20 years ago, but uh, what an amazing recovery. And same with the Germans, by the way. They did quite well. Now, uh, so, but Ukraine, I, I doubt it can recover. It has lost so so many men, so many people have left the country. As soon as the war is over, a lot of these groups are going to turn on each other. The military, political class, the public are not happy with any of this. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they open the borders. More people might actually leave than come back. So it's a, it's a demographic crisis. It's a, yeah, it, it's it's just uh, yeah, a horrible situation to be in. But uh, I, I agree that uh, uh, that uh, my my main concern in Valdai, because I remember in 2022 when I first where after the Russians had invaded, I uh, when I was there in October, I the, the, there was some concerns, you know, because they realized that they walked into a trap. They thought they were going to put the military in, remember? And uh, the the Ukrainians would agree to restore their neutrality. Russia would pull out. They would uh, no more NATO. They can live in peace. Everything would be fine. And then when they found out that the Americans, uh, as has also been discovered, that they would instead sabotage the peace to go for a long war uh, for the objective of defeating Russia, having regime change in Moscow, then uh, then they realized, you know, there was just a very different war. So when I came back again, Valdai in 2023, they, at this at this point, uh, the Russians had built up a huge army and they were very prepared for a war of attrition, which were, they were you know, grinding down the Ukrainian army. Indeed, uh, this was after the summer um, offensive as well, so which had been defeated. So uh, you saw them very confident. Uh, now I came back this year, um, last week, and I guess my, my concern was there might be almost too much confidence because uh, everyone realized the war has been is 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 finished. The only one who pretending as if Ukraine can still win are the you know the journalists who are working very hard to keep the war going. The but but the war is over. But for me, I yeah, an issue also brought up in Valdai was you know if you won the war, but you should look at how to win the peace because if there's an overkill, uh, um, Ukraine ceases to be a functioning country. Uh, relations with uh, the Europeans become. Uh, extremely tense and uh, we don't have any political settlements, then it's not going to be good for Ukraine, it's not going to be good for Russia, it's not going to be good for the continent. So, uh, which is why when you're at the you know cusp of victory, uh, one should still, uh, and you have the ability to win everything, take, take it all, you should still consider the possibility that uh, one side, um, yeah, going for an overkill, that this is not an ideal scenario. You it's it's hard to think at the end of the war, but you do want to accommodate the security concern of the other side. So after the war, you want Ukraine to be in a position where they can feel safe, where the Europeans aren't, uh, you know, no matter how stupid it is that, uh, you know, Russian tanks going to roll in and take Poland or whatever these people are talking about. So you want to have some kind of settlement. And I guess this is my point. I think... Uh, the Russians do are keeping the door open. They are saying, listen, uh, we, we never shut down diplomacy. This is what the Europeans are saying, by the way. Uh, it was the Europeans and Americans who shut down diplomacy. They didn't want to sit down with the Russians. The Russians never said that they were against diplomacy. So they say our door is still open. Uh, but my concern is if we don't <laughs> walk through the door, if we don't uh, agree to sit down now and find a diplomatic solution, uh, the Russians are going to 
you know, we consider it a threat to expand NATO after the war. The Russians will simply make sure that they will be completely secure uh, through a complete military victory. In my opinion, that would be overkill if they take, you know, everything from Kharkov to Odessa and uh, make the rest of Ukraine this dysfunctional rump state. It's going to be a horrific situation in Ukraine. It's going to dis. Uh, keep this uh, instability on Russia's border. The Americans, of course, will want to continue to use them a little bit for guerrilla warfare against the Russians to, you know, bleed, continue to bleed them in a few, uh, for a few more years. So it's not going to be good for anyone, uh, especially for the Ukrainians. So, um, so it is in the interest of Russia to negotiate. I always make the point, can you trust the Russians? I always make the point, you can trust them to act in their own interest and uh, i think it's in their interest to have a diplomatic solution to this to find an agreement that okay this is no nato that has to be the foundation and these are the new borders because territorial concessions can't be avoided if we can make this deal everyone signs under um, you know we can have a workable peace thereafter in the failure to do so i see the complete destruction of ukraine uh, many more deaths especially towards end of the wars which is when deaths usually increase and um, it's going to be a peace which is based on uh, on the to total victory of Russia and one which does not necessarily take much consideration in for the Ukrainians indeed their peace will dependent be dependent on Ukraine being a dysfunctional state uh, completely defeated so this is a horrible outcome which is why I said uh, very much in uh, Valdai you know you should uh, uh, make sure that you win the peace here. And that's not necessarily the same as uh, having total victory on the battlefield. But uh, but uh, the the Russian counterparts would s challenge me. They'll say, you know, we our door is open. We, we're willing to talk. It's the, it's the West that doesn't want to talk to us. So what can we do? And, this and they're is, not this, wrong. This is, a this is a huge danger, actually, to Russia and a danger that should not be underestimated. There can be great defeat coming out of great victory or after great victory, or after you believe you had the victories and that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we had strategists in the US and inside NATO who would who would be thinking about exactly that, how to how to transform this victory into a poison pill to blow Russia up a few years down the road. That would this be exactly the NATO mindset. But this is also something re repetitive in the Russian history. Keep in mind that the Russians defeated Napoleon. They saved the continent from uh, Napoleon, uh, total victory. This would have been a, a, a good outcome. But what happened? By, by crushing the French, uh, it ended the whole rivalry between the British and the French. And thereafter, after the defeat of Napoleon, they, they, became, they became more uh, aligned, given that they were no longer competing for dominance. And, uh, and then the French and the British together go and fight the Russians in, in Crimea, uh, in the Crimean War. Um, you know, you had the, uh, also uh, yeah, the victory in World War II, uh, again, crushing defeat on the, on the, on the uh, Germans. And, uh, you know, before this, you had some rivalry for dominance of the seas between the British and then the Americans. This kind of exhausted the British. Now they're subordinating themselves more to the Americans and they're cooperating against the, the Soviets. Indeed, they're also Germany. Um, in the, all of Western Europe, when the, uh, when the Soviet Union was so unbalanced uh, in terms of uh, there was no balance of power anymore in Europe, they were so big uh, after winning in World War II, it uh, it incentivized the Americans to send their well to to build up a military bloc on the European continent, have all the Europeans ally against the Soviets. I mean, this is uh, um, yeah, you, you you don't want to go for the overkill almost. This is uh, it's. Um, it's uh, no. no. So uh, in a, in a, in a sense, Russia needs to find a way. Russia needs to find a way to to deal with Ukraine in a way that that leaves Ukraine that 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 prevents Ukraine from becoming again a way to to weaken Russia. Right. I mean, the best case scenario would be for Russia to find a way to make Ukraine a Japan, a Japan of. of Eastern Europe, because the way that the U.S. transformed Japan from, an, from a very bad enemy into a uh, a friendly ally is like one of the hugest success stories of like any power winning a war, um, and that's that's a that's a challenge that's completely different from like winning a victory on the battlefield. 
Yeah, indeed. Well, with Japan, there was also, um, and Germany for that sake, is as soon as you have another enemy, this is a good way to uh, maintain the dependence because this alliance, of course, is uh, very much based on a huge <laughs> dependence on the United States. Uh, but I'm not sure what, um, I think the Russians are in a dilemma because uh, they have to ask themselves, why would the United States want to, or the Europeans want to finish the war? I mean, we're not even fighting with our own men. So, um, so the, a good war for NATO would be a war of frozen front lines where mm -hmm. the Ukrainians and Russians just kill each other over years. This would be, you know, slowly draining the Russians, hoping for collapse in the economy and future regime change. This would be a good war for NATO. Uh, the, the problem is once the territories begin to shift hands, as they usually do uh, once uh, one side has been exhausted, now it's no longer that great war for NATO because you see once the Ukraine is starting to lose huge amount of territory, this is not a good war because we would like, you know, the territories not to shift. Uh, at least not in uh, Russia's favor. So the, the, my, my point is the dilemma for Russia is how do you incentivize the West to sit down and talk? Well, you begin to take more and more territory. But the more territory you take, the more complicated any diplomatic process is going to be. Uh, I mean, look at now, the West are, we're starting finally, uh, politicians and media beginning to speak about the possibility of finding a peace with Russia. Well, what are we suggesting? Okay, you can keep Crimea, uh, and we'll, you know, uh, and, and we'll send in like European peacekeepers. You know, the, the people have been fighting you, by the way, so sending the weapons to patrol the borders. And Ukraine is not going to be allowed to join NATO for another ten years or something. This is just beyond absurd. This is, uh, you know, you 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 can't go back to this. So, uh, so we we haven't made our peace with the idea that these territories have been lost. There's no way Russia is giving these territories back. We can call it immoral all we want, but this is just the reality. They're not going to come back. So so I think this is the dilemma. Uh, you want the West to talk, you have to take more territory, but the more territory you take, the more unattractive any peaceful settlement is going to be, more difficult to swallow. So Yeah, but that might, be, keep... that, that might be the point where the negotiation actually needs to needs to take into account the best interests of of all parties in order to come to an end right and i understand the point that russia would will not give up these territories i understand that yet that might be the biggest bargaining chip they have in order to actually to get to the point where where you can forge an uh, an agreement not based upon something like minsk but something verifiable more like the um the um uh, the the the, the the, the treaties with the US with the verifiable uh, um, uh, missile missile protocols, right? Something verifiable, not build on trust, but build on 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 uh, on an actual system of governance. But yeah, what what I thought the Russians might be able to might be willing to negotiate on is not handing back the territories, but um, perhaps changing some of the administrative borders. Because keep in mind that the four territories the next. They're not controlling all of them, and uh, Kherson and Saporozhye, uh, a lot of the territory is on the western side of the Dnieper River, which aren't in Russian control uh, at the moment or will be in the f uh, coming weeks. So there, there is possibility that, uh, of course, now they put very absolute terms, but uh, in, in any negotiations, it is possible that they would... Uh, agree to change some of the administrative borders so the Ukrainians would feel more safe by having yeah, the Dnieper River as a defensive line because the Ukrainians need something and this is the main uh, problem that uh, uh, Russia cannot live with NATO in Ukraine it can't live with uh, NATO it can't live with de facto NATO where we bring Ukraine yeah. into NATO uh, in everything but name as we did before 2022 um, they want to complete the coupling of the West, which is why they're not going to want NATO peacekeepers in Ukraine either. They want the West out of Ukraine because uh, they see the Ukraine war as the West using Ukraine as a tool, uh, as a dagger against the Russians, which is uh, yeah, quite reasonable. So, but the problem then is so Ukraine has been destroyed, it's exhausted. Uh, so their, their reasonable concern is Russia will uh, simply give it a few years and then uh, severely weakened uh, Ukraine standing all alone could then be completely consumed or at least the Russians could uh, take another chunk. So they have reasonable security concerns and uh, maybe some natural barriers is uh, is exactly what you need. So 
Uh, this is why also uh, the overkill in terms of victory, if uh, Russia crosses the Dnieper River to go for Odessa, this could make it uh, very difficult for Ukraine to have any sense of security uh, in the future. And uh, well, in my book, I cite this former the head of uh, the chief of uh, MI6 because he made this I forgot his name but he he made this argument that you know Putin is a religious man uh, probably every night before he goes to bed he prays to God and asks why didn't you put some mountains or rivers on this uh, you know because flat landscape this is where all the invasions came from from the Poles from the you know the French the Germans uh, so you want some <laughs> natural fortification lines or barriers uh, there's nothing in that part of the world. So I think the Dnieper River is as good as it gets. There's, there's, a, there's a lot left to discuss, but the point of how to win the peace is a huge one and an important one. And Glenn, um, I will link to all of your profiles, especially to your YouTube channel. Um, we will talk again about this. Glenn Deason, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks. Thanks.